Hey everyone, welcome to another Power Monkey podcast. On today's episode, Chad and I interview Patrick McEwen. Patrick is one of the world's foremost researchers uh, when it comes to breathing and breathing techniques. And I guarantee you that when the episode's over, you will change some of your opinions as to what preconceived notions you have as to what is proper breathing, um, the methods of how we breathe, nose breathing versus mouth breathing, uh, deep breaths versus um, more shallow breaths. A lot of the things that we've normally been taught are going to be kind of turned on their head in this episode, and Patrick is going to tell us exactly why breathing is so important, not only from a sleeping perspective, from a brain development perspective, from a training perspective, but all of these things are intertwined in a lot of really interesting ways. Um, I think we could have talked to Patrick for a few more episodes, and hopefully we'll have him again on in the future, but this is a great introduction into the importance of breathing. I highly recommend you checking out his book, The Oxygen Advantage, which is a great in-depth look into the science behind a lot, of, a lot of what he discusses, but it's a great starting point in terms of how important breathing is. So hopefully you guys enjoy this episode. Patrick McEwen. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for taking the time to be on with us. Um, you know, uh, I think both Chad and I recognize how much in the, uh, the media and the news these days, breathing has become such a hot topic lately. And you've been at the forefront of this for such a long period of time that uh, we're kind of very, very lucky to have you on with us. So thank you for taking the time. Yeah, of course, Dave. I think it's great. You know, it's, it's just taken 20 years to become an overnight <laughs> success. So it's, it's all good. Right, right. People don't see the, uh, the yeah. feet underneath the water, all the paddling that goes along. To, uh, <laughs> That's for sure. Point, right? Yeah, they, they, don't see the, they don't see the blood, sweat and tears, you know. Right, right. <laughs> Only the end result. Uh, but I, I want to kind of jump in really quickly with the reason why it's taken so long for people to realize that this is a needed topic to discuss. You know, forever, we've been told basically the opposite of what you're suggesting. Uh, You know, taking long, deep breaths is valuable. And, you know, in with the good and out with the bad. Oxygen being our friend, carbon dioxide being the enemy. Um, Why is it that all of these things have been taught to us by so many different, you know, areas kind of being inundated from these messages that are essentially false? Why why did that come about? And, you know, why had it become such a, um, a method for us to be able to kind of wrap our head around why breathing is the way that it is? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. It's difficult to say precisely. I think people didn't go to the depth of breathing the way they should have gone. Um, it's all too easy to say, slow down your breathing. But, you know, breathing is not just about slowing it down. Breathing is not just about getting amplitudes of the diaphragm. It's not just about the biochemistry. Breathing is about looking at three dimensions, and that's looking at the biochemistry from the point of view of carbon dioxide, looking at the biomechanics with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs, and looking at slowing down breathing to achieve a coherence. Now, too often what's happening is that people focus on one dimension and they sacrifice the other two. So you might have one, one instructor might be focusing on the biomechanics, but in the process they're telling the person to breathe hard or breathe more air, and in that process, they're sacrificing the biochemistry. You have another, another instructor who's focusing on the slowing down the breath cadence breathing, and they might necessarily be looking at the biomechanics, nor looking at the biochemistry. So I think it's the depth to which people came. And I understand it from the general public because, like, I tried breathing exercises. I remember going to do an exam. I was in my final years in a university in Dublin, and I was as nervous as hell going into this exam, into the exam hall. So I was after reading a book on breathing and it was telling me to take these long, deep, big breaths. And I went for a walk for five minutes, taking these long, deep, big breaths. And I went into the exam hall completely lightheaded. And that's misinformation. Mm. And over the years, I've met people coming in with depression, with anxiety, with asthma, and the breathing exercises that they have been practicing and the belief that that it was going to help them actually made it worse. And I think it's from... You know, instructors and authors who have the best of intentions, but don't go down into the depth of knowledge to which they should do. And even if you were to teach breathing, if anybody is to teach breathing, there is one rule that they should look at. And that was discovered back in 1904. It's called the Bohr effect. And basically it states that the carbon dioxide in the blood is a catalyst for the release of oxygen from the red blood cells to the tissues. Now, knowing that alone, you would know about the importance of breathing light or at least having normal biochemistry. And with that, then you wouldn't be encouraging your students to breathe hard. 
Now, if we look at, say, for example, there's a book written by a yoga instructor, Robin Rottenberg. And Robin Rottenberg is based in Fall City in Seattle. And she's been teaching yoga for 30 years. And then she develops asthma, she develops sleep apnea. And her yoga is taking her so far, she's making some progress with it. And then she comes across breathing light. And that completely changes everything. To the point that she comes over to Ireland, she stays here for a few weeks, we train her, she's training with us, and then she goes back. And she writes this book, 120,000 words. And in her research, when she went back to the ancient yoga teachings, the original yoga masters in the ancient, you know, when it was being developed, whatever, how far she could go back, she was seeing that breathing should be subtle, breathing should be light, and breathing shouldn't be hard. And there is a saying in yoga that man's life is measured not by the number of his years, but by the number of his breaths. Well, fast breathing, hard breathing go together. So I think there was an innate wisdom there that got lost. And it has certainly got lost. And it's great to see it being rediscovered. That's fascinating stuff. It's so glad. I'm, I'm, it's interesting to see people who are yogis and people who, you know, have breathing as such a forefront of what they do now changing their mind and going back to, uh, you know, the ancient techniques as being the ones that are the ones that are valuable. Um, I do want to go into um, uh, the, the bolt test a little bit, because I think this is such an important part of what you teach and such a good a good discussion point for not only the athletes that we generally have listened, but also general population, just to kind of set a standard for what, what you're working with. Would you mind going into the bolt technique a little bit and no, bolt test a little bit and, and letting people know kind of what, where the value is and what the, how they can actually utilize it and kind of say, okay, what does my starting point look like? Yeah, sure. Of course. Like there's a very simple breath hold measurement that can give you feedback on how well you breathe and you're sitting down for about five minutes you take a normal breath in through your nose, a normal breath out through your nose, you pinch your nose with your fingers, and you time it in seconds, how long does it take until you feel the first definite desire to breathe, or the first involuntary movement of your breathing muscles. And when you resume breathing, your breathing should be fairly normal. Now, what does that feedback show you? Well, it gives you some feedback in terms of people with a low bolt score, they tend to have increased breathlessness, disproportionate breathlessness. And for an athlete, you can imagine that you know, physical training doesn't change your breathing patterns. It's your everyday breathing that determines how well you breathe during physical activity. So during competition, your breathing during competition is influenced by how you are breathing in your everyday. If you have an athlete going around with their mouth open, or if you have an athlete, somebody that's suffering with anxiety, people with anxiety, 80% of the anxiety and panic disorder population have breathing pattern disorders. Now, a breathing pattern disorder is not something that's jumping out at you. It can be very subtle. It's fast upper chest breathing. And it's just breathing can be a little bit faster. Breathing is in the upper chest. Breathing can be sometimes through the mouth. Breathing can be irregular, as in, for example, somebody who's having frequent sighing. But that faster upper chest and irregular breathing is going to translate into breathing problems during physical exercise. And the bolt score provides feedback of that. So somebody with a low bowl score, they typically breathe faster. They typically breathe upper chest. They typically have disproportionate breathlessness during exercise. Also, fast breathing affects the emotion, so focus can, be, focus can be affected. And sleep, because if we breathe fast, we are more likely to be aroused from sleep. Now, Professor Kiesel is a professor of physical therapy from, I think, Evansville University in the United States. And he looked at 51 subjects and he determined that the one way um, to determine breathing pattern disorders in the athlete population is breath hold time. And he described it exactly as the bolt score. And his conclusion was that if your breath hold time, if your bolt score is above 25 seconds, there's an 89% chance that dysfunctional breathing isn't present. So the minimum bolt score that we would look for is 25 seconds. And the goal is 40 seconds. Now, I've had plenty of professional athletes here with me, and I've seen bolt scores as low as eight seconds, and I've seen bolt scores as high as 50 and 60 seconds. And, you know, there's a huge variance there. And when you're talking to the athlete, they know that there's something quite not right, that no matter how hard they are training, they tend to plateau. And they know that 
they, you know, it's, it's, they just have that little bit more breathlessness that they are fatiguing, they're gassing out too soon. So you could even look at athletes in a press conference and look at athletes, how they are breathing before, not when they're doing physical exercise, but just as they are sitting there and try to see, can you see a little bit faster, a little bit upper chest breathing, no gaps between, you know, no pauses after exhalation. You can predict on the basis of how that person is breathing during rest, how they are going to breathe during exercise. So I, I've done the, the, the test a few times and I've gotten a variety of scores. <laughs> yes. It's kind Can of happen. jumped quite a bit. So I yes. got, and I've gotten 15, I've gotten 26, I've gotten 21. I've gotten a variety of kind of jumping around. And I, I'm definitely a nose breather. I've never really breathed out of my mouth my entire life. Um, I have no real issues with sleeping and things like that. But I think anxiety is a big issue with me in terms of me being able to keep that score where maybe my physical fitness should say it, it should be. Uh, I'm curious what you recommend if you're having like fluctuations in score and what, what's kind of accurate. Well, you know, if many people will say they're nasal breeders, do you wake up with a moist mouth or a dry mouth in the morning? Most of the time it's fairly moist. Most okay, so it's a good moist. sign. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And with that then, because... Say, for instance, if you do have an individual who is mouth breathing during the night, even though they can be nasal breathing during the day, nasal breathing as best they can, um, there's six to eight hours that they have hard breathing through an open mouth. The best thing about measuring the bowl score is be consistent at when you measure it. And the most important time to measure it is first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. As soon as you wake up, sit in the bed, sit up in the bed, allow your breathing to settle and measure your bowl score. And that is the main, that's the most important measurement because if you measure it during the day, it's going to be influenced by physical exercise. It's going to be influenced by the food that you eat. It's increased by stress levels. It's increased, it's, it's, sorry, it's influenced by stress levels. It's influenced by fatigue and female breathing is much more vulnerable to hyperventilation than male breathing. And even though this has been known since 1905, Young females, because of the menstrual cycle, days 10 to days 22, post-ovulation, during the luteal phase, the increase to progesterone is a respiratory stimulant. Their carbon dioxide levels can drop by up to 25%. This increases fatigue, anxiety, and also contributes to increased pain. Because if we are breathing too fast, too hard, pain thresholds are lower and the pain perception is high, higher. So... You know, I suppose it can, you know, and also if you have somebody with exercise induced asthma, they will typically have a lower bolt score. Or if they had childhood asthma, they have a lower bolt score. And as you said, a little bit of anxiety kicking in there drops the bolt score, panic disorder. And with panic disorder, you can have real extremes hmm. because you can have one cohort of that group that have a very strong suffocation feeling. That as they start breathing and carbon dioxide is releasing in the blood, they've got a very strong reaction to the accumulation of CO2. So it depends person to person. Yeah. The, the only other uh, question I had about that is um, normally you're seeing an upper uh, kind of limit on a, a bolt score of around 60 seconds. Are there any detrimental effects to something beyond that? Say someone is able to get up to 80 or 100 seconds. Does it become detrimental at a point or you're saying like 60 is kind of the optimal point? No, it doesn't become detrimental because the bolt score is only holding the breath to the first definite desire to breathe. And, um, you know, it, but you will, you will not find people with a bolt hmm. score of 80 seconds. Hmm. Um, now, it is, you know, there, there is documentation in terms of yogi masters that were meditating all day, that they were locked up in their, up in their cave, people were breathing, bringing food to them, that they had all day and every day to just focus on their breathing that their bowl score could be 180 seconds, three minutes. Wow. wow. And, you know, that, like, that's one thing. But if somebody who's living in modern life, it was pretty much impossible. It's difficult enough for people to get up to 40 seconds. And genetics play a role here, but it can be trainable. Hmm. So, you know, I'd say quite a few of your athletes, like many of the people listening here will be shocked that they have a bowl score of less than 25 seconds. But then... Do you have nasal stuffiness? Well, if your bowl score is above 25 seconds, your nose will be much freer. Do you have exercise-induced asthma? Do you have faster breathing? You know, all of that. And we have to think that breathing is a cost. You know, there's a cost associated with how hard you breathe. 
as we sit here, about 2 to 3% of our oxygen consumption is going to support the breathing muscles. If we do moderate exercise, it's about 5 to 6%. If we do intense exercise, it's about 10%. Maximum exercise is about 15%. But if you have a breathing pattern disorder, whereby your breathing <clears throat> is disproportionate or that har bit harder, you're wasting more energy unnecessarily. Hmm. So there is a way to breathe and there's, not a there's a way not to breathe. And I often wonder why runners, the vast majority of people who do physical exercise, breathe through an open mouth. It is something that has struck me so many times. Why do they do it? It just hmm. does not make sense. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I want to confirm for the listeners real quick, uh, we're talking about the Bolt score, that's B O. LT, and we will put some some links potentially in the description section and stuff like that, so uh, folks out there can get some more information and maybe test them test theirs themselves. Um, and also, you know, I want to get into some things that people can potentially do to improve their score and how that might affect their daily life and and their you know their athletic ability and all that stuff. But before we do that, you know, as I sit here and listen to you, and and you're obviously an expert on the topic, you you have a strong passion for it. Uh, so I want to kind of get to the base of that. And, and I'll tell you, Patrick, I'm a sucker for motivational and, and inspirational stories. In fact, I'm right now uh, on this journey of making myself, I don't have to really make myself do it, but I'm holding myself to watch a 5, 10, 15 minute um, YouTube video that's a motivational speech just to get some you know, motivation and inspiration for myself to learn how to do that myself a little bit better. And as I was researching you, I noticed that... Um, you have kind of the similar, a similar story to what I find in all those motivational speeches. These people, they become very successful. They become who they are from a major challenge, a major obstacle in their life. Maybe it's a tragedy. Maybe it's a, a birth defect, whatever it is. And for you, you had asthma yourself. And I just wanted to point that out. I want the listeners to know that, that this all started from, um, you know, you growing up with asthma and having to take medication and you trying to find a way to be able to breathe better yourself. So one, can you tell us a little bit about that, what that was like for you growing up, what, uh, maybe what medications you had to be on, and really what was the turning point that led you to dig so deep into um, being able to breathe better yourself? Sure. Um, so growing up as a kid in, in Ireland, and um, I was wheezing from a young age, but do doctors were they were originally reluctant to diagnose it as asthma. And I think it was not to shock parents. So back in the 1970s, I was born in 1973. So as a four or five-year-old, you're typically not diagnosed with asthma. You're told, your parents are told, child has bronchitis. So it kind of lessens it. But I had constant wheezing. And I'm not sure when I first went on medication, but I was certainly about eight, nine, 10 years of age. And from the age of eight, say, to, to until about 24, 25 years of age, I was in constant medication. Now, it wasn't just about asthma. I was wheezing continuously. I didn't cough, but it absolutely affects your quality of life in terms of physical exercise. But the biggest impact it had on me was my sleep. And I didn't know it at the time. I was a chronic mouth breather, and that's typical with asthma. And asthma affects about 8 to 10% of the normal population. And because of chronic asthma, you have inflammation of your lungs. That inflammation can travel up to your nose. So your nose is stuffy. And if your nose is stuffy, then you're 1.8 times more likely to have sleep disorder breathing. So I was snoring, but I was told I was stopping breathing. So I was exhausted all the time. Now, I would never put together a stuffy nose and sleep apnea. And sleep apnea is a huge condition affecting many, many people, predominantly male. But when a, when a female hits 50 years of age or between the ages of 47 and 54, it increases 300%. And it exerts a huge toll. So I was going through as a chronic mouth breather, trying to study, um, going to university. And for me to get any sort of grade, I really had to put my head down. So my entire teenage years into my early 20s, was my head was stuck in books. And I was studying 10 hours a day. And very few youngsters are going to do that. And I can't imagine them doing it now. But I was driven from the point of view, economically, we weren't doing so well as a family. So I had a drive and a motivator to, to kind of catapult me out of that. I got into a very good university, into Trinity College in Dublin. It's one of the top universities in Europe. And I was in their business program, economics. And again, I was in the corporate world. 
high stress, but it wasn't necessarily the corporate world that was the problem. It was, it was my ability to deal with it. Because if you've got a really lousy sleep, and if you're waking up groggy every morning, and if you're a mouth breather with fast, hard upper chest breathing, you're in a constant state of fight or flight. So your concentration is affected, your performance is affected. I had a racing mind. I would go for a walk, I wouldn't even see where I was walking because I was constantly living in my head. You know, And it's amazing in terms of, I came across this primarily by accident. And I came from a business background. If somebody told me to go into this as a business, it was the worst business decision anybody could ever make in the history of mankind. <laughs> it, it was totally illogical but it felt the right thing to do. And, I, I, you know, I came across a newspaper article. That's what catapulted me onto it. So I read about the importance of breathing through the nose. I used the nose on blocking exercise, simply holding the breath to open up my nose. That night, I wore Breathe Right strips across my nose and I, I taped up my mouth. That was back in 1998. The first morning I woke up feeling, yeah, well, just didn't really notice a whole lot. I was probably getting used to it. The second morning I woke up at the best night that I had sleep and a concentration that I woke up feeling alert there and I knew there was something, it was an incredible night's sleep that I had not experienced or could not remember in the previous 20 years. Now, despite going to doctors, despite going to dentists, no healthcare professional ever told me Patrick breathed through my nose. And this is a travesty because... 50% of study children, up to 50%, are persistent mouth breeders. Nobody's telling them any different. And this is where it's great in terms of breathing now is getting some attention. You know, and you could ask, well, why has it not? Well, it, you can't commercialize breathing. You know, you can't put a patent on it. It's, it's really about somebody's time. And you can't scale it. You can't just make it into this multinational that could be done that typically is, is happening in our healthcare system. But at the same time, we can't afford not to look at it. So yeah, it was two years later, I felt like I, I didn't automatically just say, oh yeah, this is great breathing through my nose. Now I'm going to jack in my job and start teaching breathing. <laughs> no, it was two years later. I just had a, a good feeling and I had a feeling that it was just the right thing to do. And I said, okay, I'm in my mid twenties at this point. I've got nothing to lose. So I get back to the company car. I went and lived in my girlfriend's family's sitting room for one year. I slept on their couch. I used the mother's car to drive around. I had no costs, no mortgage, no nothing, only myself. And I said, if it goes pear-shaped, I'm still fine. So I trained in Russia and I come back and, yeah, do you know, it worked. And it worked wonderfully. Um, and it's been a tremendous, it's been a great kind of a job that suits a skill set that suits me. And I would say I've had a tremendous life in terms of teaching and loving a job. And there's very few people, I'm very fortunate, you know, that, and this should be taught in schools. There's a few things that should be taught in schools. Number one, child's intelligence is graded based on their academic achievement. However, there is absolutely no consideration taken on the, the quality of that child's sleep. And there's no consideration taken in the quality of that child's breathing. And both sleep and breathing are going to influence that child's academic ability. And I'll give you a statistic. Karen Bonnock did a study. This is well documented, but it's all buried in PubMed. And it's not accessible to the general population. Well, it is, but you'd have to dig a little bit into it. Karen Bonnock did a study in Stratford-upon-Avon in the UK. And it was published, I think it's in, published in Pediatrics, which is the Journal of the Pediatric Association in the United States. And she looked at 11,000 children over a H, an eight-year period, children with sleep disorder breathing. If untreated by the age of eight, they had a 40% increased risk of special education needs. Mouth breathing is a significant contributory factor to that. Now, you're talking about one in 10 children in the United States having ADD, ADHD, autism, some learning difficulty requiring special education needs. It's not, just, it's not just an economic problem, it's a moral problem. And it has been failed. And I've seen like, I teach internationally and I talk at conferences. I've seen doctors get up. One is Dr. Sheldon, S-H-E-L-D-O-N. I've seen him stand up in front of his peers and he say, there is no such thing as ADHD. 
The problem is that these kids are having constant sleep interruptions. They're in a sympathetic activation all night long. They're waking up and they're fueled on adrenaline and the kids can't calm down. We have to start waking up to breathing. And it's not just about, and I think, you know, people say, ah, oh, sure, breathing, you like, take a big breath, take a deep breath. It's not, it's nothing like that. And I think yoga really has to change as well. They have the potential, yoga instructors have the potential to reach out to millions of people. It's not about filling your lungs full of air. It's not about how you breathe in the yoga studio. It's about how you are breathing outside the yoga studio. How do you breathe when you walk down the street? How are you breathing when you do physical exercise? How are you breathing when you're asleep? And it doesn't matter whether you're, um, you know, you're just a normal Joe Soap or an elite athlete. I've seen elite athletes with poor breathing. And despite the support staff that they have around them, nobody is looking at breathing. So, yeah, I know with, with Dave, you were saying that definitely the awareness is happening. I think we're just on the cusp of it. Mm -hmm. So when that tipping point happens, is normally when about 8% of the population get it. Now, I think we've, we've got a while. We've got a while before we get there, but it's happening. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things that it's too simple of an answer for people to be able to grab a hold of it very easily. It's like it's so easily in one ear and out the other. It's just like so many, or I mean, you know, the few major basic concepts that we teach in weightlifting and, and gymnastics, as you know there, Dave, but it takes someone like you with so much passion, with so much drive on a specific to topic to make people listen. So I'm thankful that you're out there doing, doing it. I mean, I just learned about you, you know, not too long ago and I'm already learning so much and, and certainly going to try to apply some of these principles. And, and once again, we want to dig into those a little bit, but I think it's important to spend just a, another moment on, you know, individuals out there that might be listening that have struggled with asthma and still do through their whole life or sleep apnea. And so from your experience and, and with what we're talking about now is the answer for them simply to start learning to breathe out of your nose? Is that their first step? Well, it's a, it's a good step. I'm not saying that we're going to cure asthma. I'm not saying that we're, we are going to cure sleep apnea. But let's just look at the physiology of asthma. If you have breathing through the mouth, and here is the anatomy. I'm not sure how this is going to come up on your screen. Mm -hmm. But here yep. you have an anatomical model of the nose. So you can see the nose here, and you can see the lips, and here's a side profile. Now, if you breathe air through an open mouth, that air is going straight down the throat and there's absolutely no function by the mouth performed in terms of breathing. So the mouth performs zero functions in terms of breathing. The mouth is for eating, for speaking, and for drinking. Now, if you look at the nasal cavity that's just sitting above the nose there, so for example, if you were to put your tongue into the roof of the mouth and draw your tongue all the way down along the roof of the mouth to the soft palate, you see that the nasal cavity is occupying a huge amount of space in the skull. As air comes in through your nose, it's moistened, it's warmed, it's filtered. You pick up a gas called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide redistributes the blood throughout the lungs. It opens up the airways. It sterilizes the incoming air. And since 1988, it was known that the pressure of oxygen in the blood increases by 10% by nasal breathing. People with asthma are vulnerable to inflammation of the airways. And there are papers showing that if you take cold, dry air into your lungs, Moisture is sucked out of the airways. The cooling and drying effect of the airway walls causes inflammation. So it makes sense to breathe through your nose and it makes sense to breathe lightly through your nose to harness the gas nitric oxide. Obstructive sleep apnea is when there's collapse of the upper airway during sleep. And the collapse of the upper airway can happen as a result of the soft palate falling into the throat or the tongue falling into the throat or you have the epiglottis falling into the throat, or you've got collapse of the throat itself. We really need to have the mouth closed because with the mouth closed, it's bringing the mandible slightly forward, but it allows the tongue to rest in the roof of the mouth, in other words, to take it out of the airway. So we need to maximize airway size, upper airway, but we also need to reduce the flow of breathing. If you are breathing hard, there's an increased negative pressure and turbulence in the airway to cause collapse. So I often use the example with people who snore, and snoring is a, is a very common problem. You know, I'm sure any of you who have had, and I remember as a student, I went to bed with, with a couple of pretty women, but I never woke up with them. 
and they were gone. And I, sometimes I seen sometimes I'd see notes left in the lockers. And how could you how could you deal with that as a twenty year old literally taking the roof down? But I often say to, to the students that I'm working with, I say make it sound of a snore through the mouth, and they go, and then do it through the nose. Now, you stop mouth snoring by simply getting the mouth closed. So we tape. And we have a tape that is special around the, around the mouth so it, it doesn't cover the mouth. So mouth snoring stops immediately with mouth closed. Nasal snoring will significantly reduce by changing breathing volume. Because for me to make that sound of a snore, I have to close my mouth and I have to speed up the breathing. <clears throat> and I'm tightening everything. Now... If you slowly breathe, and what I would say is breathe really slowly into your nose and then have a relaxed and a slow, gentle breath out with a prolonged exhalation, and then a very soft and slow, gentle breath in, and then a relaxed and a slow and relaxed, prolonged exhalation, and again, you're having a very soft and slow breath in, now try and snore with slow breathing through your nose. So try and snore with slow breathing through your nose and you will see that it's not just about the anatomy that's causing snoring or sleep apnea. We have to look at flow. You need an engineer to work in sleep because an engineer work, understands that it's not just about the diameter of a pipe. It's about what's going through it. And sleep medicine has all been about the diameter and nothing about what's going through it. So if you have somebody with a low bolt score, and it's only since 2018 that a Harvard medical doctor called, I, I can't remember his, well, if, I can't pronounce his first name, Lou Dif, it's his um, Italian name, Messino is his surname, that he investigated one of the phenotypes of sleep apnea called loop gain. And 30% of the population in sleep apnea have what's called high loop gain, meaning that they have got a strong chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide and that it's feeding into their sleep apnea and his paper was, how do you diagnose high loop gain and sleep apnea, breath hold time? Wow. Well, we've been using breath hold time for 20 years. And now there's one paper after coming out in terms of diagnosing a phenotype of sleep apnea. And sleep apnea, to give you an example of the statistics of it, in one paper that I was reading recently, males between 30 and 49 years of age, it affects 26% of them. That's one in four. But when the man hits 50, 50 to 70 years of age, it's 43%. So it's almost one in two. Females, it's 9% of the female population between, nine, between 30 and 49. But when the female is in around 50, when they're going through menopause, it triples. It increases 300%. Now, obstructive sleep apnea is responsible for 20% of road traffic accidents Pilots are falling asleep behind the wheel, flying jets. They've missed, they've over, overshot runways by a half an hour. Train wrecks, one serious train wreck in Newark as a result of driver fatigue. And it happens and it increases as well with obesity. And the reason that obesity can contribute to sleep apnea is because when you have a lot of fat on the belly, it impinges the amplitude of the diaphragm, which is the main breathing muscle. And when we have reduced amplitude of the diaphragm with breathing, it reduces lung volume. And with reduced lung volume, the throat is more liable to collapse. Hmm. So, you know, this is just applying this. And you, we can apply breathing re-education to all four phenotypes of sleep apnea, to snoring, to insomnia, to asthma, to diabetes, to um, epilepsy and some forms of epilepsy, to anxiety, to panic, and I'm not saying that this is a cure-all, but where is the research on slow breathing? It's all centering around heart rate variability biofeedback. So I said there's three dimensions to breathing, and one of those dimensions is looking at changing the breathing rate to 4.5, to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute for periods throughout the day to stimulate the vagus nerve, to increase the sensitivity of baroreceptors, which are pressure receptors in the major blood vessels, and these in turn are increasing what's called heart rate variability, which is a clinical measure of stress in the human body. And it's also a measure of sympathovagal balance, the balance in the autonomic nervous system between the fight or flight response and the rest and digest response. Now, 
Individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder, with depression, anxiety, irritable bowel syndrome, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, and a, a huge cohort of conditions have reduced heart rate variability. We can influence that by changing breathing. And we have many, many people going to, because, you know, people report into me in terms of the evidence, well, it's anecdotal, but we have to start somewhere, that since they've started taping their mouths at night, they've seen improved heart rate variability from slow breathing. And, you know, it, this is not, none of this is new. Like, there's a paper written by a doctor, John Dulliard, who is a doctor in Ayurvedic medicine. Back in 1991, he looked at the brainwave states and athletes who breathe through their nose during physical exercise. They entered the zone. Because we have to think about the connection between the nose and the diaphragm, the connection between the diaphragm breathing muscle and the emotions, the connection between nose breathing and slow breathing, and slow breathing bringing a calmness to the human mind. We need an alertness, but we also need relaxation coveted zone that most athletes would love to be able to replicate. And I believe that we can, we can replicate that. We don't just replicate it on the morning of an event, but we bring breathing into our everyday life to train the brain to be focused, to be concentrated, to quieten the critical mind. So that it's almost that, you know, that if you think about Western education, Western education is has taught us how to teach, to analyze, to break information into tiny pieces. It has taught us how to be analytical. We have been trained how to think, but we have not been trained how to stop thinking. We have lost control over our minds. The vast majority of people in the Western world, they have a mind that's racing, a mind that's all over the place, and social media is contributing to it. There is no question the advent of smartphones, you look at the next generation of youngsters who are addicted to phone technology, their brain is trained to be distracted. The problem with this is loss of control over focus. And when we think about concentration, that's our ability to hold our attention on a subject matter for a period of time without distraction. For how long can you hold your attention exclusively? 100% of your attention on that subject matter Without distraction, that's the zone. And some people have been tremendous at it. Tiger Woods, yeah, people will say his private life. Forget about his private life. Look at what the man achieved on the golf course. Look at his powers to focus. Nothing would get in the way there. And for any quality of work that we achieve, our family life, our relationships, our happiness, we need to have the capacity to control our thoughts we need to be aware of our thinking, and the breath is a good bridge to that. Patrick, I want to stand up and give you a round of applause. I mean, <laughs> yeah. this, is, yeah. this, is, uh, this is beautiful to hear uh, how yeah. passionate you are about this stuff. It's stuff, and stuff that everybody needs to hear, and I think you're right on. I have two, uh, two daughters uh, who I know are going to be going through this next change in life where social media is at every turn of the corner, and uh, how it's going to affect them, not only in their attention span, but in all of these other factors as well. I think it's critical. Um, our world is very much working with athletes. And, you know, we work pretty closely with the CrossFit world and with athletes that work a lot in high intensity training and that kind of stuff. You know, Chad and I don't really fit into that category, being that both of our individual sports were more um, anaerobic sports, seeing around, bursts of speed, weightlifting, gymnastics. Uh, but we're in the world now where there's a lot of uh, high intensity training, a lot more aerobic training as well. Um, through some of the reading that I've uh, gone through in, uh, in your book, uh, you talk a little bit about the difference uh, that you see with high intensity training and some of the things that you recommend in terms of combination of nasal breathing as well as mouth breathing when you start to get into that really high level of training. Would you mind yes. uh, describing why it's important for maybe that type of training to incorporate a combination of mouth breathing and, and nose breathing and how they differ from every day? Yeah, of course. Like somebody comes in to me, if, the, if the, you say repeated sprintability in team sports, um, you think of a basketball player, footballer, soccer player, even MMA fighter, you know, they're doing a round, there's, the, there's a sprint, there's a very brief recovery followed by a sprint again. 
in terms of improving that, and this has been shown by a paper that was published by Wurons, a French researcher, looking at professional rugby union players from Australia. They were 21 years of age, 35 individuals. He divided them up into two groups. He had one group do breath holding on a sprint, a 40 meter sprint with breath hold. Followed, there was a departure every 30 seconds and there was eight reps per set, two sets per week in the first week. And by the time the fourth week came, it was three sets. It was only four weeks of training. Now these are professional, highly trained rugby union players. Their repeated sprint ability before exhaustion was nine reps. They could do nine 40 meter sprints before exhaustion with a departure every 30 seconds. The group who were taught breath hold training, in other words, take a normal, same exercise with the oxygen advantage. Take a normal breath in and out through your nose, pinch your nose and hold, and sprint for 40 meters on a breath hold. Then have semi-active recovery for 30 seconds and sprint again 40 meters on the breath hold. Within four weeks, their repeated sprint ability increased from nine point something, I can't remember exactly, to 14.8. Now, that is a phenomenal increase in just four weeks because when you're dealing with elite athletes, you're talking about getting fractions of a margin. Mm -hmm. The control group were taught high-intensity interval training. That's what they were practicing. No change. And the group who were doing breath hold training, they were doing their sprinting on the breath hold. They dropped one of the anaerobic sessions. So in other words, not to overdo it. So I think certainly there's a role in terms of improving the, how, like, how was it possible to improve their repeated sprint ability? I think part of it was able to improve their buffering capacity. If you think of why athletes do high intensity interval training, may, oftentimes it's to stimulate anaerobic glycolysis. It's to put the body into an oxygen debt to force the body to make adaptations. If you wear pulse oximetry and you go for a sprint with normal breathing, your blood oxygen saturation will typically drop from normal 95 to 99%. It will drop down to about 93%, 91%. You're barely hypoxic. If you do a sprint and a breath hold, you will drop down into 80%, down into 70%, but not to hyperventilate before the breath hold. We don't do the Wim Hof technique, which will be hyperventilating for 30 breaths and then a breath hold. We just have normal breathing and then we do a breath hold. And the reason that we have normal breathing and then we do a breath hold is because we want to have a combined hypoxic. In other words, lower the blood ox lower the, the oxygen, have an adequate oxygen at the tissue level, hypercapnic, high CO2. So it's low oxygen, high CO2. That combination is disturbing the blood acid base balance to force the body to improve the buffering capacity, probably inside happening inside in the muscle compartment. But with that, I think we're also training as the central governor in the brain. There has to be a part of the brain that's monitoring the stress of the body during physical exercise. And if it feels that the body is overdoing it, the brain sends a message to the legs to slow down. The athlete has to, has to give in. So there could be something happening there. There could be a few different aspects happening. But I would say to people is, look at Wuron's paper, W-O-O or O-N-S, and it's repeated sprint ability and hypoxia with rugby. And you will see the description of the exercise there. And I would just say, if the female is pregnant, don't do breath holding. If you've got any serious medical conditions, don't do breath holding to perform a strong, strong air hunger. But we have been using breath holding since 2002, even to children as young as five years of age. And a lot of work would I, I would have done with children over the years kids coming in with asthma, kids coming in with stuffy nose. We use breath holding to open up the nose. And you might think it's kind of weird. Well, if you go to any swimming pool or you say you have daughters and I have, a, I have a daughter as well, if they go to a swimming pool, they'll typically get a diving stick. They throw it into the bottom of the pool and you see the kids going in afterwards. It's breath holding. It's an innate function of the human being. We've always been doing it. And part throughout our evolution, we would have been going down for food, for instance, down to the sea floor. So with an elite athlete, what approach would I take? I would absolutely get them breathing through their nose during sleep. I would get them breathing through their nose the vast majority of time during rest. I would teach them functional breathing with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs. When they are doing physical exercise, 
their warm up should encompass primarily nasal breathing with five breath holds. And the reason being is five breath holds to stress the body, to open up the blood flow to the brain, to increase blood flow to the brain, to open the nose, to open up the airways, to get spleen contraction. The spleen is our blood bank. It contains about 8% of our red blood cells. And if you do breath holds to a strong air hunger, you provoke the spleen to release red blood cells into circulation. So during the warm up, it's all about nasal breathing and breath holding. And then during training session, nasal breathing at low and medium intensity and breathe through your nose to add an extra load onto your breathing. But then when the intensity gets quite high, switch to mouth breathing and then switch back to nasal breathing. So we do understand that when you switch from mouth to nose breathing, that your intensity levels will drop by about 10%. And we don't want anybody, especially elite athletes, we don't want them to decondition. So we want, I say 50% of the time with the mouth closed and 50% of the time with the mouth open. And some of the sprinters I was working with, they were 400 meter sprinters. They did some of their 400 meter practice runs with their mouth open. We did 400 meter sprints with their mouth closed, some of them, to add an extra load. And then on other ones, I stood on the 360 meter line. They sprinted with their mouth closed for the first 360 meters. And then when they seen me, they had to hold their breath for the last 40 meters. So I added on a breath hold at the end of that because fatigue sets in at the last 10%. And 10%, of course, of 400 meters is 40 meters. And that's when I added the extra load. But in team sports, I've had team sports do their practice sessions of, say, 60 minutes to 90 minutes. The last 10%, we taped up the athletes. They were taped up. The last 10%, they had to do everything taped up. And again, adding an extra load. So I think we can be innovative here with this, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that we're, that we're getting the results is that nobody has done it before. That's right. why. Right. I did a, a testing out some workouts over the last few days. I, uh, I did a mile with my mouth shut over the weekend uh, just to kind of test it out. And then yesterday I did a Metcon um, with my mouth taped shut, um, half an hour Metcon. And first time I had ever done something like that, um, there was a little bit of like anxiousness at first. And then the last few minutes, I felt amazing. I actually felt really great. And then afterwards, when I took the tape off, there was almost like this euphoric sense. I don't, I never really, it felt very easy to breathe. I felt like the nasal passage was very, very clear. And it actually felt like I could recover more quickly. And I didn't notice that in the past. And, you know, it was more of a high intensity training and I did no mouth breathing at all just to kind of test it out. And it was surprising to see how well I felt afterwards. I got done and I felt like I recovered much more quickly. It was a surprising, a surprising uh, feeling. Very, very cool. Good stuff. Too. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Um, so you, you, br you brought him up and I'm curious kind of if you could expand a little bit. There's so many little tidbits as you're talking here that I'd like to expand upon. But um, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned um, the breathing techniques that Wim Hof has been using. And obviously he's, he's very prominent uh, in the world of breathing techniques and like that. And him using more of that hyperventilating technique of breathing through the mouth and, and then working on the, the long holds at the end of that. Uh, I'm curious... The, the benefits that are being found there from the, the, the majority of the people that are using his techniques and, and how that differs from, uh, from what you're, uh, you're proposing. Sure. Like with, with the technique that we're doing, there's two pillars to it. One is improving functional everyday breathing mm -hmm. and the other is to give exercises that are a stressor. So we look at both. The Wim Hof technique is primarily a stressor. It's 30 breaths, hyperventilation, followed by an exhale, hold breath, and hold the breath up until a medium to strong air hunger, and then to let go to breathe in for 10 seconds, followed by hyperventilation again for 30 breaths. During the hyperventilation, you get rid of a lot of carbon dioxide from the, from the blood through the lungs. And the loss of carbon dioxide, which is the primary stimulus to breathe, allows you to hold your breath for a lot longer than what you would ordinarily. If you hold your breath then for a lot longer, you're dropping your blood oxygen saturation to quite low levels because you don't feel the need to breathe because carbon dioxide has been depleted. So again, if you hyperventilate and you get rid of so much CO2, you're dropping your CO2 levels from say a normal of 40 
we'll say down to 20 millimeters of mercury. You're not going to feel the need to breathe until that CO2 climbs back up. And it's going to take quite a while to climb back up, up until the point that it triggers your breathing again. Mm -hmm. But the extra long breath hold with the Wim Hof technique allows you to drop your blood oxygen saturation to a point that's a lot lower than what we would do with the oxygen advantage. Gotcha. So it is a stressor. And in the, I'm not sure about the research on the, on the Wim Hof technique. I know there was one paper by Matthias Cox that looked at the, in, the influence of the autonomic nervous system from stressing the body, that when individuals then were injected with endotoxins, which should generate flu-like symptoms of fever, of headache, etc., they were better able to resist them. So I think it's a very interesting technique. Um, you know, it's a very interesting technique. And one thing that I would be cognizant of is, yeah, stressing the body is an upregulator. And what we also need to have down regulators. We need to have a balance with breathing as well. But you know what? It's good. And I think he's done great work. He's done great work for putting breathing on the map. There's no mm -hmm. question about it. Now, you talk about... <clears throat> oxygen saturation levels reaching a point, you know, below 90. Is this at all kind of simulating altitude at all? Yes. And I'd like to just kind of go into that a little bit, this idea of what's optimal with training. You know, both Chad and I, I spent, uh, I lived at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs for four and a half years and uh, lived at altitude up in Colorado. And, um, you know, my sport wasn't as f affected as much, but it's very noticeable living at, at that altitude. But I'm curious, um, one, what you've, what you recommend in terms of optimal training, you know, a lot of people have been saying uh, living at, uh, at altitude training at, at sea level mm. is kind of optimal in terms of the advantage that you see as an athlete. But can you go into a little bit of that in terms of the, the saturation levels, what, what that's simulating and then what the benefits are of actually uh, training sure. And at those. Sure. So the technique that you described there is the live high train low model by Levine and Gunderson. I think it was developed back in the 1990s. Um, that's, there is a difference in terms of athletes going up into high altitude whereby they are there for sustained periods of time. And the objective is that when you live at high altitude, because the air is thinner, so oxygen is still 21% of the atmosphere, but atmospheric pressure is reduced. And as a result, the oxygen in the blood or the fraction of your hemoglobin with oxygen is going to be lower. That's forcing the body to make adaptations. There is a hormone erythropoietin that's generated by the kidneys and the liver to a lesser extent, and that stimulates the maturation of red blood cells. So you're able to influence your aerobic capacity by living at altitude. Now, when we are doing breath holding, the difference is that it's intermittent. We are only doing um, altitude simulation of altitude for brief periods of time, followed by normal breathing. Mm -hmm. And breath holding it's not just about dropping the blood oxygen saturation, but it's also about increasing carbon dioxide. You're also putting an extra stress onto the breathing muscles. Um, there's more going on in terms of, you know, it, there are some similarities there, but there are some differences as well. The main thing is that the dose is probably similar, but the duration is a lot right. different. Right. And because we're physically doing breath tolling, we can have athletes that don't, may, may not have access to high altitude. Um, but even the perception of breathlessness, like if I get some athlete and I ask them, and we always do five easy breath holds first, and then we go into the stronger ones. And typically I would say to them, take a normal breath in and out through your nose, hold your nose, start walking, fast walk, jog, run, sprint. We're pushing that individual into a state of breathlessness that they would never experience, even during a sprint. And that has a training impact. So even just in the perception of breathlessness. So yeah, I think like high altitude training has always been interesting since the, ever since the, the, the Olympics in Mexico, mm. when athletes came back down to sea level, they, they were sur surpassing their, pe their personal best. Um, but breath holding could be a very interesting one here. And here's another aspect of it. If you have an athlete who is injured, they can't train or at least they can't train at the intensity of what they would normally do, so they decondition. They should be doing breath holding while they are walking. So during rehabilitation, you can st still stress the body, but you don't have to do much physical exercise to do it. And that will help to maintain fitness levels as well from a respiratory point of view. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, Pat Patrick, I'm surprised. I mean, with a lot of stuff that you're saying, it, it's all amazing. And you know, I got on here expecting to hear you talk about breathing, of course, and we've been talking about breathing 
but I've heard you say breath holding a lot more than I thought it would. I didn't even know that that was going to come up or that was going to be something that we talked about. I, I haven't dug into the research that, uh, that much. I haven't been able to get my hands on the book yet, but I wanted to bring us back to that because you said uh, you talked about uh, athletes should do that in their warmups. And yes. I think that's a really good um, topic to kind of cover here before we uh, start heading towards wrapping things up, because I think it's a really good potential recommendations for our listeners and something that I want to try out and apply on my own. So for me, I, I probably warm up differently than, than most CrossFitters do. If I do a CrossFit workout, I'd just jump into it with, without much warming up. And I know that's not good, but <laughs> when I'm warming, warming up for weightlifting, I go in, I warm up my whole body. I swing my legs. I do a, a different variations of the squat. I do some, some individualized mobility. I do some, some shoulder prehab and re rehab stuff. And then I grab the bar and I slowly build up and weight with the exercise that I'm starting with. So I'm warming up my patterns. I'm war warming up my body for my w weightlifting workout. And we can even say, you know, someone that does something similar, but they're warming up for CrossFit. Maybe they, you know, get on the rowing machine for 500 meters. So they run uh, 400 meters or, or a mile or something like that. When you're talking about holding your breath, you said five sets. One, what does that specifically look like? How long are we aiming for? How much rest between those sets and where should that go? So for me, for example, if I'm just going in, I'm starting off with leg swings and I get into my squat variations, should I do that holding breath the, as the first thing that I do somewhere in the middle or at the end of my okay. warm up? Yeah, sure. So it doesn't really matter what sort of warm up you're doing, but we have to think about what is a warm up. If you look at a curve called the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, you will find it in Google. If you just put in oxygen dissociation curve, you will see that it shows you the effect of increased temperature and carbon dioxide on causing the release of oxygen from the red blood cells to the muscles. So if you gradually work up the muscles and if you increase carbon dioxide in the muscle, you're increasing oxygen delivery to that muscle prior to going into more intense exercise. So typically with a warm up, I would always say to, to our students are, start off very easy with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs. By breathing through your nose, take fuller breaths, but less of them. It, in, it increases alveolar ventilation, but it's very good for anybody with pre-match anxiety. <clears throat> so we start off with the first few minutes, five, 10 minutes, going at a, a light enough intensity, which should be a warm up anyway, all sustained with nasal breathing. After about 10 minutes or so, then I have them, regardless of what they are doing, breathe in through their nose, breathe out, hold their nose or just lock their throat and keep on moving during the breath hold and move a little bit faster as the breath hold increases and keep going until you have a strong air hunger then let go, but minimize your breathing then for about six breaths. So take minimal breathing for six breaths. It prolongs the effect. And then have normal breathing for about 12 to 18 breaths. And then after 12 to 18 breaths or whatever, like it doesn't, it can be a minute. If you have it a minute in between each strong breath hold, the second breath hold the same again. Whatever you're doing, take a normal breath in, normal breath out through your nose, hold your breath and keep moving your body as you're holding your breath. Even if you're doing shadow boxing, you're holding the body, hold, you're holding your breath. Keep going until the air hunger is pretty strong. Then let go, minimal breathing for six breaths, normal breathing then for about 12 to 18 breaths. Do it five times. Okay, you've gone from a state of relaxation with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs, which is calming the mind. So initially we started off the warm up, calming the mind, improving alveolar ventilation, getting more air down into the smaller air sacs in the lungs, but without hyperventilating, without taking big breaths. That's, that's a calming effect, but we don't want an athlete going out too calm. We do the five strong breath holds to take them out of that calm response to stress them, to push them, to open up the nose, open up the lungs, increase blood flow to the brain, cause spleen contraction. And at the end of the five strong breath holds, then typically I'll ask the guys, take a couple of heavy breaths just to blow off some acidity, and then you go out. And the other thing about it, when you do a strong breath hold, your mind stops thinking. We want to get that critical mind pushed aside because we want muscle memory to kick in. Anybody who's been training consistently over years, all of that information is stored in the brain. And we want to get the critical mind aside to allow that information to get out. So 
there's probably from a psychological point of view and a physiological point of view as well. Um, but I think increasing blood flow to the brain can be very important. You're feeling alert afterwards, and that's the way to go out. I think that's a great tip. I think that's something that's very usable for, for the listeners. That's more usable for, for myself, you know, um, on top of just being more uh, present and aware of whether I'm breathing out my mouth or uh, breathing out my nose. I wanted to touch on um, real quick as well, just breathing and weightlifting. And, and what I mean yes. by that is specifically the, the snatch and the clean and jerk, right? So in, in my competition lifts, I'm going to lean over, I'm going to grab a hold of the bar with the hook grip, I'm focusing and preparing my mind. But the last thing that I'm going to do before I lift it, I'm going to take in that deep breath and I'm going to brace my body with yes. as much effort and energy as I possibly can. Um, and then, and then the lifts over very quickly. So, so the breath is held through the whole lift until I've got complete control of it. Maybe I'm waiting for the down signal and I breathe at that point, I'm going to have to, um, but I've got control over it at, at that point. So talking about that a little bit, but also talking about some of the other training that we do. And, and again, in weightlifting, we typically don't breathe very hard, but we may do heavy sets of five in the back squat or the deadlift or even sets of 10 or even sets of 20. And thinking about that set of five, I'm just, I'm just envisioning myself and a lot of other athletes that I've watched countless uh, number of times do uh, squats and deadlifts. There is a, uh, for a lot of athletes, there's a purposeful um, breathe out and in the mouth, and then they're holding that brace on each rep. Um, or there's a subconscious, uh, them doing that subconsciously. Maybe some of them do it through their nose as well. But a lot of us are blowing out of the mouth aggressively, and then we're taking that last breath back in very deeply. Now, should I, as a weightlifting coach, in your opinion, and me as an athlete who still does sets of five and sets of 10, sets of 20 in the squat, should I be purposely taking that last breath in my nose and trying to breathe out and in my nose as I do those sets? So I, I take my breath, I do my squat, I stand up, I breathe out my nose, however many times I need to and in, I take that last breath in the nose and then go again and finish the set. Is that how you would recommend? Okay. I don't know exactly, but I'm going to just give you this because this is going to be something that you're going to have to test and to see what way is working. We have to think of the generation of intra-abdominal pressure by virtue of the use of the amplitude of the diaphragm. So as you're taking, as you're lifting that weight, you're typically breathing in. And as you're breathing in, the breath in is driven by the diaphragm moving downwards. So it's bracing the abdomen to provide stabilization for the spine. But the generation of the intra-abdominal pressure there is influenced by your normal everyday breathing patterns. Mm. I wouldn't be concerned too much about whether the breath was through the mouth or the nose. But the only thing as I would say is that your nose breathing is typically connected with the diaphragm breathing muscle, that you would have a greater amplitude there. So you're able to brace it. But I do think that lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs is a very important breathing technique for anybody involved in weightlifting because you need that stabilization of the spine. And a gauge of the generation of intra-abdominal pressures is whether when you breathe in, are the lower ribs pulling out? And when you breathe out, that the lower ribs are moving in. So normally when we breathe in and the diaphragm is moving downwards, we'll have some front movement we have movement to the sides and we have some movement to the back, that the diaphragm is not just the muscle for respiration, but it plays a fundamental role. And also that's influenced, and I'm talking about, you know, stabilization, functional movement, functional breathing, the two go together. But also the other aspect about breathing shot is that when we have an exhalation, we should be having a normal exhalation. Because what's called a zone of opposition is the area from the top of the diaphragm after a normal exhalation down to the lower ribs. And it's the zone of opposition which will also influence the generation of intra-abdominal pressure. So I think they're going to be interlinked. And also individuals with lower back pain, which could be possible in your industry, I'm sure, they typically have dysfunctional breathing patterns that can you can you imagine a weightlifter they're sleeping with their mouth open they have their mouth open most of the time during the day and then during the weights they're dependent on that use of the diaphragm breathing muscle but they haven't been using their diaphragm effectively all day long right. and now they're engaging it while they're lifting a weight and um, the nose if you go for a run with your mouth closed you're forcing a greater resistance onto your breathing and this will help to maintain diaphragm strength 
So I think the muscle there itself, we should be working with. And yeah, you know, I, I think it's going to go hand in hand. Yeah, it would be interesting. I don't know exactly how to answer your question precisely, but I'll throw those thoughts out there anyway. Yeah, no, that, that's a great answer. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you saying that you're not sure because it's, it's far too easy. Just, you know, you know, you know enough about your topic that you can make something up. I find myself making stuff up about weightlifting uh, on a regular basis. And I got to go, then I got to go confirm and make sure I didn't say something stupid. But, um, but no, I do appreciate that. And it makes a lot of sense because what the athletes that I watch, whether they're breathing out of their mouth or uh, out their nose, what I'm looking at and I'm making sure that they're accomplishing through their squat sets or in their Olympic lifts is that they're not holding their breath here. They're not holding in their chest. They're not, you know, holding this shrugged position because to me, those are muscled positions that I don't want. So it is important that they put their air uh, down below and that they're tightening that diaphragm uh, as you're talking about. And, and for whatever reason, I think it's just because, you know, the level of training I was doing and the weight that I was lifting, I was never taught to do that, but my body figured that out. Uh, on its own because I had to do that to lift more weight. And so I think that's one, if we can just sidestep and, and just make a good teaching moment for those listening in who want to lift more weight. One, we've got to place the air more down below as opposed to holding in your chest and holding in your shoulders whenever you're bracing for any lift. Uh, and, you know, to piggyback off what you're saying, it, it sounds to me like they're going to have a better chance to do that if they are breathing out there or breathing in and out their nose. Yes, during their everyday. We might as well have good breathing mechanics during rest, during exercise, during sleep, and whatever you want it, you just tap into it. Like breath holding is fine for brief periods of time while lifting weights, only for brief periods of time. If you do, for instance, really strong breath tools with um, a lot of weight, you're going to drive up blood pressure. Now, will you drive up blood pressure beyond what you will ordinarily do during a weight lift? Yes, you will. And that's why we would say during, if people were asking me, should I do a really strong and long breath hold by lifting weight? Typically, I would say no. I've seen systolic over diastolic increasing 220 plus. Um, I think that the, the systolic was dropping quite significantly. I can't remember what it was. But we've seen changes in blood pressure that were happening that were quite pronounced by doing long breath holds during weight. So I think a short breath hold during weight, very natural thing to do. We will naturally breathe in and hold the breath to brace the core, to brace the abdomen. And it's like the abdomen becomes like a pneumatic balloon. But for that, we need functional breathing. Well, I'm not worried about any weightlifters I know holding their breath too long. They're, they're not very good at that. But, <laughs> but to, to the point, what we're talking about is maybe they should be. Maybe they should be getting a little bit better at that. And again, I'm going to go back to that recommenda recommendation that you made, not only for weightlifters, but CrossFitters, athletes in general, to try – those five breath holds during your warm up. I'm certainly going to be doing that myself. And Patrick, maybe I can report back to that on you. Do for sure, Sean. And when people are doing breath hold training, I would say at most do five repetitions twice daily. Don't go beyond it. Okay, perfect. Patrick, I don't know if you know about our Power Monkey camp, but I, we got to figure out a way to get you there. I think you'd absolutely love it. And we would love for you to be able to kind of pass along some of this information to the coaches, own, gym owners, athletes of all levels that we have come to our camp. I think it would be an amazing addition. So something I want to talk to you about afterwards. I sure. think we can go into these topics so much more. There's so much I would love to, to speak to you about. We maybe have to do a part two uh, if you're up for it sometime down the road. Um, but since we are coming towards the end here, we just have a couple of final questions here for all of our guests that we like to finish with. And the first one, uh, this is probably the first one that we've had, Chad, so far that I, I don't really even know what the answer yeah. might be. Normally, I kind of yeah. have an inclination in what direction, but Patrick, from your expertise in your athletic training world, which do you prefer, gymnastics or weightlifting? God, let's say I have no idea there, I have to say. <laughs> Absolutely, totally floored by that, by that question. Well, let, um, let us know which, which sport you'd rather watch if you're going to watch. I would probably, Olympics. well, in terms of something to watch that's really, really nice in the eye is gymnastics. And I'm talking Thank about the go. skill and I'm talking about the mobility, the flexibility, et cetera. Well, I, I think, uh, Chad, Sorry, Chad. Chad. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I think, hey, I think. I, I can provide yeah. a video for you of Chad doing a uh, clean and jerk in slow motion. That will be like one of the most, most beautiful artistic, uh, you know, poetry in motion things you'll ever see. And it might change your opinion to the artistry that goes into weightlifting. 
Uh, well, I appreciate sure. that. I appreciate that, Dave. Yeah. He just feels sorry for me, Patrick, because it's beat me so bad. Most people answer gymnastics, but uh, but that's okay. I'm 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 working hard to bring it back. And and Dave, go ahead and send him that video. Hey. Oh, you got it. You got it. Uh, yeah. Question number two for you, Patrick. Um, is there anyone that you would recommend that we reach out to to have on the podcast? Anybody that you think might be a good guest for us to have? Um. I think a very interesting guy would be James Nestor. He's written a book on breathing and his book has become pretty much an overnight, well, not an overnight because he spent about three years, four years writing it. It's been a phenomenal bestseller. Hmm. And I think definitely, you know, in terms of his knowledge and putting it out there, it's been tremendous from my world. Yeah. Uh, I think we actually just lined up James for September. So, oh, uh, very good. Yeah. So we, we got him uh, on good stuff. Soon, so I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah, we're, we're on the same page here for, uh, for <laughs> sure. And uh, last question for you here, Patrick, um, and it's kind of a two-parter. The first part of it is, um, what, what would you rather do? Would you rather read a book, watch a movie, watch a documentary, a TV series, or listen to a podcast? And whichever of those that you like the most, do you have a specific recommendation? I love two things. I love documentaries um, and I love reading books. I read some tremendous life-changing books, as many of you have. If I was to say the one that was really life-changing, it's The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. I'm sure many of you, your listeners will have known about it anyway. Documentaries, yeah, I, you know, that's, that's something that I, I, my kind of, my pet hobby then would be architecture. At the moment, I'm kind of, kind of looking at YouTubers, these explorations in abandoned houses. So that's my, my downtime. But yeah, I live in a, a very quiet part of the world totally rural, totally isolated and spending some time out there is pretty cool as well. So I've got a, a very simple life. That, that sounds fantastic. And, you know, before we get off here, I do want to point uh, people your direction a little bit because you have a lot of, uh, a lot of knowledge and, and, you know, information that can help uh, people specifically in our community. I know you have, I think I read you have eight books and um, uh, the most recent one that, that people are most familiar with. But you also, I noticed on your website, you also have a two-hour Zoom class that you offer um, occasionally. Can you let us know how often you um, offer that and uh, where people can find it? Sure. The two-hour Zooms are typically we do one once a month. And uh, it's a two-hour, it's, it's live, obviously, virtual, that I'm going through the theory. But I bring people through about 12 different exercises. So I go through functional breathing and I go through all dimensions of functional breathing and then I put them into functional breathing during movement and then we put them into breath toll training as a stressor and then we have a down regulation as well. So they get the video afterwards. It's $95, fairly reasonable for the two hours of training and typically we'll have about 30, 40 people on it. So there's plenty of interaction as well for questions, et cetera. Very, very regional, uh, reasonable. That sounds, that sounds cheap and very doable. Um, I wonder, you know, talking about Zoom sessions, is that something that you have been doing for a while or is that specifically uh, due to quarantine and stuff like that? No, we've been doing them for quite a while, but with quarantine, like typically my, my travel schedule was 18 months I was booked out for. Hmm. And I flew in from Los Angeles on the 17th of March and I was due to fly to Sydney on the 19th of March. I just got in from the United States. I think uh, President Trump, he put, he put the lockdown down on the night of the 17th and <laughs> right. I couldn't fly. So I haven't moved since. And I'm, do you know what? I'm happy out, I have to say. So <laughs> right. Zoom, Zoom has worked. I think, I think something that could be a silver lining and part of this as well, it's very nice just to slow down a little bit, just to regain some composure. I think it's good to do. Yeah, might we say slow down and breathe? How about that? that that's kind that's of a, good. A good that works. <laughs> um, you know, that being said, do you, do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? Anything else coming up that, that you'd like them to know about? Yeah, do you know, I, like, I would say look at your breathing and even just kind of be more aware of your breath. Don't live stuck in your head. Take your attention out of the mind onto your breathing. Are you breathing fast or are you breathing upper chest? Are you sighing? Do you have your mouth open during sleep? Do you wake up with a dry mouth in the morning? Are you gassing out too soon? Just pay a little bit of attention to it. And always think of breathing in terms of LSD. And some of your 1990s teenagers will remember those three letters. Light, slow, and deep. So light is about the biochemistry. Slow is about the cadence of breathing. And deep is about lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs. To breathe deeply, 
you don't have to breed big. Mm -hmm. Don't sacrifice one dimension in terms of another. Always bear in mind the three. And I think a bit of awareness, you know, our breath is the constant companion. We are either stuck living in our head or we can connect with our breathing. And it's not about new agey. This is about, this is about tools that you can really use in your everyday life to bring many benefits to it. You know, so yeah, start, start incorporating it. Awesome. Patrick, it's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. We really appreciate you or having you on. I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan, you know, uh, digging into you, doing some research and now talking to you. I'm, I'm certainly going to be keeping up, um, listeners out there, be sure to head over to powermonkeyfitness.com for services and upcoming events. We have our own zoom classes going on that, that we'd like you guys to jump in on. Also check out our Instagram pages for regular teaching and technical content at Power Monkey Fitness, at Dave Durante, and at Ollie Chad. On behalf of Power Monkey Fitness, we're your host. I'm Chad Vaughn with Dave Durante. And until next time, guys, thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.